Hello, and welcome back to Behind the Post. Today, I'm joined by Andrea Fernandez, a first-generation Latina, passionate about communication and its role in human interaction. Andrea attended San Jose State University, where she obtained a master's degree in mass communications and journalism, and a Bachelor of Arts in Communication Studies and Chicano Chicana Studies. She is passionate about giving back to her community by paving the way for future generations entering the academic and professional world. Outside of her day-to-day -day role as an award-winning global social media manager at SUSE, she is an avid traveler, dancer, reader, and foodie. Andrea, are you ready to go behind the post with me? I sure am, Olivia. Thanks so much for having me. Super excited to chat with you today. Of course. I'm so excited to chat with you too um, and all of the amazing things that you're doing at SUSE. And like I mentioned, you are an award-winning social media manager. For anyone tuning in, she recently won the Best B2B Social Media Campaign Award. So congratulations. Thanks so much. I'm honored. <laughs> So I want to dive in about all the amazing things that you're doing, but before then, I would love to know how you came to be the social media extraordinaire that you are today and what brought you to SUSE. Yeah, you know, I think my story about coming to SUSE is really one of, full, of, of a full circle moment, really. I'm, I'm big on those, but uh, my early career days actually start back um, in Spanish language media, so I've always had a role in, in a communications organization. Um, you know, I started interning and then eventually start, came back as a full-time employee um, at a local Spanish uh, speaking station here in the Bay Area in California, and then to Univision um, Communications, which is one of the largest um, Hispanic uh, broadcasting companies here in the US and in Latin America. Um, and then, you know, my career progressed through the public and private sector. And my last role actually before SUSE I was working in local government um, for the city of San Jose City Council, um, of course, in a communications um, role where I, you know, drove a lot of the social media strategies, um, ran a, essentially one woman communications team. Um, during my time there, I've actually traveled to uh, Europe with some friends and um, our last stop was Barcelona. Um, and this is where it gets really, I think, um, you know, talk about destiny and, and being reluctant to an opportunity or, or when a door opens. But um, it was our last night in Barcelona and um, we stopped by at a, at a restaurant. And uh, there was a, a woman there who overheard us talking and, and realized our accent was definitely not Spanish. Um, and she, she asked, where are you ladies from? You know, and then we got the conversation going. One thing led to another, and for the first time, I actually heard about open source and about SUSE, and it was a little bit above my head, and I was like, that's great, sounds like an awesome concept, but I have no background in technology. I, I'm not an engineer, I'm a communicator by heart um, and mm -hmm. by, you know, academia, so how does this tie back to me? I had just finished grad school, um, and so, you know, she was, um, she's like, add me on LinkedIn, you know, we'll connect, we'll chat. And I thought nothing of it, just another LinkedIn connection. Mm -hmm. And to my surprise, a few months later, actually, she reached out and mentioned, hey, you know, I, re I remember you from Barcelona. I hope you made it home safe. Um, there's an opportunity at SUSE to be a global social media manager. And again, I was like, okay, this is a little above my head. Um, yeah. But, you know, considering that, you know, I had nothing to lose if I didn't try, um, I gave it a shot. And two years later, as of today, actually, um, I've been at SUSE. Wow. Oh my gosh. Talk about right place, right time. It was meant to be that that's an incredible story. Wow. Well, congratulations okay. on two years. That's so exciting. For anyone tuning in that might not have heard of SUSE, could you just give us a brief overview of what you guys are doing and the value that you're providing to your customers? Absolutely. So SUSE is a global leader in innovative reliable and enterprise grade uh, open source solutions. And were relied upon by more than 60% of the Fortune 500 um, to power their mission critical workloads. Uh, we specialize in business critical Linux, of course, um, enterprise container management or Kubernetes as it's commonly referred to and edge solutions. Um, we have a really close collaboration with our partners and our communities to empower our customers to innovate everywhere from the data center to the cloud, to the edge and, and beyond really. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I'm seeing it throughout your employee advocacy program as well, and that's what I've invited you here to talk about today. I really want to dive into the details because you are running an amazing employee advocacy program, and 
for anyone tuning in that's maybe in the process of starting a program or really is looking to start one or writing their strategy, I want to get really granular and talk about all of the details so they can hear your experience and it can help guide them. So I want to start off with a few of the challenges that you have faced. So for you, what would you say was the most challenging part of starting an employee advocacy program? Yeah, definitely. You know, as a social media manager, as I'm sure you know, we're deep in the trenches of social media, and we personally know the value that it brings in amplifying our brand and amplifying all of the good stuff that's going on within our organization. But I think one part where when you're not as active in social media as a social media manager would, or somebody who's just um, a very active social media user, you have a hard time understanding what the value of participating in social media even means, or or why do it, right? The so what Mm -hmm. of it. Um, And I think convincing people or educating them that there is something bigger than just a post or a like that really comes to fruition um, Mm -hmm. was definitely one of the challenges. Um, You know, I don't have time for this. Why should I do it? Why would anyone care? I don't even have followers. Um, So a lot of those reluctancies really, I think, were a challenge, but I'd pose it more as an opportunity for anyone who's, you know, listening in and maybe looking to get started or facing some of those similar challenges, I would really just use that as a springboard to then use those as educating points and say, well, you know, actually, you do have a bigger impact than what you think, or this is what people are talking about. You're great at this, or you're a subject matter expert plug in here. So I think those Mm -hmm. are, those were some of the challenges. And another one too, once we kicked off was, um, you know, keeping the momentum going to encourage those signups. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and then just really once people were in, how do we simplify the experience and how do we keep them going and motivated to sign back in if they were dropping off, you know, maybe a month or two after being inactive, how do we get them to get reactivated and back up and running with us? So those were, I think, the top challenges that stand out when I think of our experience um, Mm -hmm. kicking off the program. Yeah, I, I think sometimes I take my position for granted at Octopus because we are a social media company. So our advocates know the power of social media, but I can see how that can be really challenging at first, especially on top of, you know, your employees workload, adding on another aspect to it can seem overwhelming to them. So I can totally see that and relate to it as well. Um, When it came to actually starting your program, how did you go about onboarding? Did you start with a pilot program and just do your customer facing roles or who did you really look to onboard first? Yeah, a great question. Um, So we actually did do a pilot program um, in which we onboarded our most active members from a previously um, ongoing employee amplification um, platform that we had. I wouldn't necessarily call it a program because it was just more of an opt-in kind of thing. Um, and so we had actually sunsetted that program prior to onboarding with Octopus. And so we took, I want to say the top 50 um, participants in that program. And essentially we rolled them out, um, you know, as our phase one ambassadors. Once we got that going and saw, saw the participation and, you know, took a look at it, we really used that to drive forward what we would call our phase two, which is when we, you know, we'll talk about it, I'm sure a little bit later, but I think the, the pilot approach really helped us get our feet wet as, as administrators of the program and then also use it as an opportunity to introduce it to the company um, and really start to set the foundation for what would become our phase two um, of the program. Mm-hmm. Okay, so you started with people who were already posting on social media, cared about their personal brand and things like that? Correct. Okay, yeah, I think that is definitely the way to start a program. If you're looking to roll one out, start with those social enthusiasts. We like to call them that are already using social and know the value and that will help with the adoption of your program. Mm -hmm. Um, But I, I really am interested to know how you are keeping the momentum going because as someone who leads a program, there are ebbs and flows, you know, sometimes shares are up, sometimes they're down. So how are you keeping your employees engaged and keeping that momentum going? Are you running contests? Are you doing um, little things here and there to just motivate them? Are you gamifying? Yeah, a little bit of everything actually. So um, when we kicked off phase two of our program, one of I think the most fun parts of it was we did what was called our referral program. 
so we actually had, um, you know, as, as we started to onboard more folks, we opened it up and said, if you um, refer five colleagues and those five colleagues stay active and share for X amount of time, you will be entered um, to win a prize. And we had prizes that range from $200 to $500. Wow. Um, so it was a very generous um, reward, um, you know, to, to keep that. And then something that stayed consistent and that we introduced in our phase two was gamifying the experience for everyone. And so our top performing advocates from each month are entered into a quarterly raffle again, for the chance to win um, prizes, which are in, in a sense monetary compensation, right, via, via our, our gift card system. Um, and so it's a really fun way to keep everyone engaged and, and motivated. And I think a little friendly competition never, never hurts anyone, right? So it's always interesting. Um, you know, sometimes I'll get pinged by a colleague who's like, hey, I'm number one again, like, where's my <laughs> prize, right? But, you know, we want to make sure that um, everyone has a fair chance of winning prizes if they're participating. Um, mm -hmm. So that's definitely how we kept, how we keep the momentum going in terms of gamifying it and offering a reward system. I think another really important part that, um, you know, I would, I would really recommend um, for, for those of you starting or who may already be well on your way with the program is ensuring internal promotion of the program from executives. So for example, is there an email going out on an upcoming announcement for the company or a really important piece of news? I always make sure that any internal communication piece going out has a line or two about where to find the content in Octopost. Mm -hmm. So then this not only prompts folks to know about it, but it also creates that sense of curiosity where somebody will click it and they're not signed up and they're like, hey, I can't access. Can you get me, you know, can you get me signed on? So it was it was a really good way to not only create awareness, but also prompt um, some additional sign-ons um, for, for the program. So that's also a really fun way, I think, to, to keep it. And then offering just a consistent flow of, um, you know, uh, points of contact with your advocates. I have monthly drop-in office hours and I call them Let's Get Social. Um, and so we get social. I tell, uh, I share best practices about social. I share some of the top performing content. Um, and I, every session, I think I get questions ranging from, hey, how can I spice up my LinkedIn profile? Or am I posting enough? Um, am I posting correctly? So I think it just, those touch points also really offer a really great way to keep people connected and motivated. Um, and then always just remind them, hey, we offer prizes if you participate. So um, mm -hmm. those, are, those, were some of, those are some of our top three, I would say, strategies for keeping momentum going within the program. Oh, I love that little like social office hour. That is such a good idea. And throwing a little curveball at you here, when you have a new employee to the company, how are you, are you asking them to join the program right away? Or are you waiting until they reach out or how does, how does that process look like? You know, I've seen a shift in, in that, and I'm very pleased to share that I don't have to do so much of the outreach anymore because um, um, managers when they're onboarding their new employees know about Octopost and so they're like hey I have a new employee they're onboarded um, or can you onboard them and, and it's a little bit different now because as we'll chat about in a little bit we have a company-wide advocacy program now so essentially everyone has access to Octopost versus you know before would we would assign um, access but you know prior to to this um, I would I would proactively you know speak with hiring managers about getting them you know, ready to go before their employee, as soon as their employee had an email address that I could input into Octopost, we were getting the ball rolling for them because it should be a staple as it is with having access to your email or, you know, to mm -hmm. Slack. Um, Octopost, in my opinion, selfishly is, is just as crucial and important as I'm sure you can agree. Um, but now that we have everyone onboarded, um, it's more so, you know, hey, I have 10 employees joining, do you mind doing um, you know, a quick how to call with mm -hmm. us and, and getting us up to speed there. But yeah, it's, it's definitely great to see that shift where people know, and there's a little bit of FOMO if you're not on Octopus. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Oh my gosh. Well, that's amazing. Um, it always helps when you already have that buy-in right away and you don't have to do as much <laughs> convincing. Um, but I, I can't wait to hear about onboarding the entire company to the program, which first of all, congratulations. That's amazing. And I'm sure your reach is absolutely through the roof. Um, but could you walk us through the process of how you 
went from the pilot to eventually onboarding your entire company to the program? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think of where we were, gosh, it seems like so long ago, but probably less than a year ago. Um, and where we're at now, and it's really hard to, to almost quant like quantify the excitement and the accomplishment that we feel really just being able to have gone from probably 50 to 60 advocates to now, you know, 2004, uh, 2,300 plus advocates. Wow. But yeah, it was, I mean, we had an ambitious goal of 750 advocates. And when I saw that number in front of me, I'm not going to lie. I, you know, I definitely freaked out a little bit inside me, but I said, you know what, there's, there'll be a way to get there and we'll get there when we get there, but we're mm -hmm. going to actively and strategically work towards it. Um, once our, you know, our phase one was well on its way, phase two essentially put us at over 350 advocates. Um, and so from then, you know, we were closer to our 750 goal than we were before. Mm -hmm. um, and it took, you know, so now we're on an unlimited advocacy license um, agreement, right? So that then, you know, prompted the conversation between our IT teams, you know, working really closely with Octopost, um, you know, our customer success manager, Taylor, and um, the rest of, you know, the rest of the team over at Octopost and ensuring that we could identify possibilities for automation um, to really maximize the experience. So that was, you know, kind of the next, the next step. Once we all kind of came together and, and identified the technological possibilities of it, um, a custom API was developed. Um, so that essentially when we uploaded our advocates to a single sign-on platform that we use, essentially they would automatically be ordered on the back end through Octopost eliminating that manual step of having to upload contacts and all of that fun stuff, right? So mm -hmm. that onboarding process to, to paint a little bit of a picture of what that looked like is given the large volume of advocates we were bringing on, we went ahead and rolled it out in a phased approach again. So we split it by department. Um, we did every other day to accommodate for any potential, um, you know, work throughs that we may have to identify or any bugs that we may have to fix. Um, and so each time that a new department was onboarded or rolled out, they were communicated through Slack um, and said, hey, you're now onboarded onto Octopus. What is it? Click on this internal SharePoint site, um, which had an FAQ, an onboarding guide, my contact, and then our monthly office hours um, so that folks could, could drop in. Um, and so it went very smoothly. Um, we had really, slim to none, um, you know, any issues. And we now have uh, over 2,300 plus advocates onboarded um, within Octopost um, while surpassing our 750 goal. Um, sometimes I pinch myself a little bit, I'm not gonna lie. But yeah, it was, it was really, I think, a very great example of cross-functional cross and really cross-organizational collaboration. Mm -hmm. um, that allowed us to make this possible. I mean, we had everyone from our IT communications team to our IT team to obviously the Octopus team, our mm -hmm. comms teams, you know, it was just, it was a, a really nice um, cross-functional collaboration overall. Yeah. I mean, wow. <laughs> I'm like <laughs> speechless Two over 2000 advocates. I, that, that's insane. And I need to know how you're balancing the content because First of all, from experience, I know that the sheer amount of content needed to keep a healthy employee advocacy program can be really overwhelming at times. I know I feel that. I'm sure you feel that as well sometimes. So with that many advocates, how are you balancing creating content for your corporate channels and also advocacy? Do you have any tips or secrets you could share? Yeah, you know, I think my biggest kind of rule of thumb and my biggest advice really is authenticity is key. Um, and I think, you know, when we're sharing content, as you know, being the, the voice of a brand, um, it's really hard sometimes to go from being the voice of a brand to then putting your, your human hat on and, and speaking or writing as you normally would on your social media. Mm -hmm. So I think with that, um, really the biggest way I balance the content and ensuring that there's, you know, an upload is, is really making sure that the content would read as if an employee would have written it, right? If, and that, that really helps, although it's the same essentially piece of content, it helps differentiate how it goes into the advocacy board versus mm -hmm. 
how it would go on a corporate channel. Now, something really unique about SUSE and our social media is that we also have regional channels which um, amplify content um, in different languages, anywhere from French to Italian, Portuguese, Spanish, um, and Polish. So we have a, German, of course, we have a wide variety of languages other than English, which are also you know, content driven. So there are sections within our advocacy board or topics that are designed specifically for content that's other than English. And so that also helps, I think, provide a steady flow and healthy flow of content um, beyond what's going on in our channels. Um, and then also just really using any corporate messaging as a basis to then adjust as you see fit. Um, mm -hmm. And then just really making sure that when you receive content, sometimes when we see the suggestions come through, right, from our advocates, that's also another really good way to ensure content is in there. Um, and a lot of the times I'll get content requests, you know, to share a, a piece of content on our corporate channels, but really being, um, I would say, analytical and cautious about what you would see that best fit in an, in an advocacy board versus what you would see fit on the corporate channels is another really good way. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of content that's actually only on the advocacy board and not on our SUSE channels just because it's so niche or so nitty gritty to a particular topic or audience that it would just make more sense for an advocate to amplify versus you know our channel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and if you really want to get your message out, definitely harness the power of your employees. Yep. Um, but I totally agree. When I first started Octopus and started um, taking over the employee advocacy program, I did find it really challenging to write as for someone else, for someone else yep. to post. It can be really challenging. So a trick that I would do um, is imagine that that person was sitting right in front of me and I was right as if I'm telling them um, mm -hmm. whatever the post I was creating. So that really helped me, but um, amazing tips and tricks there. I'm definitely going to steal a <laughs> few of those, uh, but we're nearing the end of the show here. And I just want to ask you one more question, um, kind of going along the lines of content um, and managing everything. I know every day as a social media manager is different. No day is the same, um, as you know. So how are you staying organized and managing everything? Yeah, as you mentioned, no day is the same. And I think that it's very us that can find the beauty in that, right? Um, very much. The only thing constant in our roles, I think, is change with content, with how we're posting it, with everything. So you know, we plan for one thing. And as you may know, we, we end up doing something, something else, but really the biggest tools um, for me are really just my handy dandy calendar, to be honest, you know, blocks and reminders in my calendar. Of course, Octopus, um, the scheduling is like my holy grail. I mean, I'm, that's, that's the lifeline essentially of keeping the engines running. Um, mm -hmm. So that ties into the calendar, the calendar usage. Um, and to-do lists are still totally my BFF. I mean, the Same. feeling of crossing things off that list just never gets old. Um, you know, those, those help me stay, stay grounded and organized in terms of what I need to focus on beyond the blocks and reminders in my calendar, mm -hmm. which basically correlate with what's on my to-do list, right? Um, and then, mm -hmm. of course, for very specific campaigns or projects that I'm working on, um, project trackers with due dates are, are also very very much key and, and super essential in, in keeping me on track and, and making progress towards those, those deadlines. Mm -hmm. I'm the same way when it comes to to-do lists. I have a notebook full of lists and lists, and I'm the type of person that will write something on there, even though I just did it, just so I can cross it off. I love the feeling of crossing off um, items on my to-do list. So I totally agree with you there, but I wanted to say thank you so much for coming on the show. I loved getting to know you more and all the amazing things you're doing with employee advocacy at SUSE. So thank you so much for joining me behind the post. Of course. Thank you so much. I had a blast chatting with you, Olivia, too. And I hope this isn't the first um, behind the post episode we're you know collaborating on. <laughs> yes, of course. We'll have to do it again.